Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Before we do get started, I do want to say the program's brought to you by the financial support of our listeners, and I particularly want to thank John so much for his support. And you too can support the program at support.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, the original air date, November 24th, 1957, and the title, The Hope to Die Matter. Frugal man and Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is this is George Reed. Well, nice to hear from you, George. Especially when I have no assignment. That uh, that's fine. What's fine about it? No expense account to pad means how do I keep the wolf in the door? Unless, of course, Floyd's of England has a case for me. Huh? Well, uh, Johnny. Yeah. I uh, well, a few weeks ago you were kidding at the time. Oh, now, George, how could I ever kid you? I'll uh, let that one go. Yeah, you better. The point is, you. Well, you rather jestingly asked me if instead of selling life insurance... Oh, no. Don't tell me. I'm afraid so. I'm afraid the company is saddled with what you might call a death insurance policy. You mean, instead of insuring somebody against dying, you've insured him against living? Yes, John. Okay, Georgie. Say no more. I'll be right over. <laughs> In the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the hope to die matter. Mm-hmm. Expense account item one, a dollar ten taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office, where I found him pacing the floor and wearing an even more worried expression than usual. And believe me, that's something. This thing has me so so riled up, Johnny, I can hardly see straight. Well, you should have known better than to issue a policy like that, George. I? It was Harry Baxter. Baxter? He filled in here for me while I was on vacation. I should have known better. What did he do? Sell a lot of policies that you shouldn't have to handle? No, just this one. And I swear I don't understand it. He of all people. All right, you said on the phone that it was kind of life insurance in reverse. That's exactly what it is. Explain, please. Well, usually, of course, we pay the face value of a policy when the insured dies. Right. In this case, however, the company will have to pay the $250,000 that the insured doesn't die. 250000 Yes. How under the sun could a man be crazy enough to issue a policy like that? John, you know how it is. The company prides itself on the fact we'll insure anything. Not only life and property and health and so on, but the voice of a singer, the feet of a dancer, hands of a pianist, even the dimples on the knees of a chorus girl. Yeah, and singing mice, an old alley cat, a sick whale. Of course, I can't say that Harry wasn't in position to do it, but... Johnny, you've got to help me. First, you'd better tell me who and why and what it's all about. It's just the trouble. I don't know. Well, in that case, you don't know. I only got back here to the office this morning. I found our copy of the policy lying here on my desk. But if you don't even... Oh, look, I've handled some pretty screwy cases for you, George. Yes, but they've all finally made sense one way or the other. And Johnny, we have paid you some very nice fees. You can't deny that. George. Tell me, have I ever questioned your expense accounts? But death insurance, it doesn't make sense. Have I? Insuring somebody against living. Have I? I'm sorry, but this time the answer is no. Listen, if you take this on, I'll okay your expense account without even reading it. Death insurance. Expense account unlimited. Johnny? George, there are some things even a conniving, chiseling, unprincipled rascal like myself won't even... Unlimited? Johnny? Okay, George, I'll take it. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. Lloyds of England... 
insure anything. At least that was their boast. And now it looked as though it had finally backfired on them. Because somebody in the organization, some character named Harry Baxter, had issued not life, but death insurance. If it hadn't been for my friendship for George Reed, <clears throat> well, plus his promise of unlimited expense account, I'd have thrown the whole problem right back into his face, as it was. Thanks, Johnny. From the bottom of my heart, I'll never forget you for this. Believe me, George, I'll never forget you for this. And if you can get us off the hook... All I can do is try, so come on, give me the dope on it. Yes. Now, here. The name of the insured is Miss Mary Ellen Markham. Uh, yeah, I got it. Where does she live? 514 East 52nd Street, New York City. Uh, pretty fancy address. Yes. Okay. Now, tell me why this Mary Ellen has insured herself against living. Well, that's the point, Johnny. She hasn't. Well, now, wait a minute. You... Albert Schwinner has. You mean somebody else took out this policy on her life? Or rather, death? Yes. Holy. Well, what is this guy, a professional gunsel who's going to wipe her out and then collect? I suppose he's the beneficiary, too. Yes, he is. Oh, fine. Well, come on. Who is... He? I don't know. As I told you, the policy was lying here on my desk when I got back this morning. I do know this much about him. It's Dr. Albert Schwinner. Doctor? What kind? Well, those are the things you've got to find out. Who he is, what he is, why he's bought insurance against this woman's living beyond November 10th. The 10th? Well, that's only a few days from now. Oh, George, this gets worse and worse. Oh, if only Harry Baxter hadn't issued that policy. But he has. Oh, boy, you sure picked a dilly to fill in for you while you were away. Picked him? What else could I do? After all, he never did anything like this before. You've known him before? Are you serious? Of course I have. Why, Harry? Back All right, now look, times are wasting and we haven't got much of it. I take it you want me to see if I can find some legal grounds for canceling this policy. Yes, immediately. Now, have you got an address on the beneficiary, this uh, Dr. Schwinner? No, I've been so upset about this whole thing, I haven't even looked. Yeah, let me see. According to this, he lives at... Hmm. What's the matter? Dr. Albert W. Schwinner, C.L. C.L.? What kind of a doctor is that? I don't know. The address is 14327 E Street, Union City, New Jersey. C.L.? Well, I'll soon find out. Where can I reach this uh, Harry Baxter who sold the policy? In New York at the... Uh, here, I'll jot down the address. <laughs> I still don't see how Baxter could get away with this. Well, after all, when you consider his position... Here. Here. He offered no explanation at all. Well, I'm afraid I didn't give him much chance. I practically threw him out of here. Oh, I can't say that I blame you. And that's another thing. Look, Johnny, perhaps you can reason with... Oh, don't worry, George. He's number one on my calling list. I'll be talking to you. <laughs> Expense account item 2785, fare to New York and taxi to Harry Baxter's address. A real snooty one over near Sutton Place. And people don't live in that joint unless they've earned or chiseled a lot of money from somewhere. In the case of Baxter, I suspected a big chisel. My suspicion was considerably heightened when he opened the door. His apartment was luxury from stem to stern. As for Baxter himself... Dollar? Well, of course, old boy. I've heard a great deal about you from my dear friend and colleague, George Reed. Dear friend, huh? Well, you say that as though you doubted it. Oh, I know, that filling in for him while he was away, well, I really should have done better for the old thing, but I've had so many social obligations to meet these past few months, and after all, one must keep up with those things. Oh, I'm sure one must. Well, I did sell one policy, you know, a real dilly. Ah, oh, that's the understatement of the week. I suppose I can't really blame him for being a bit excited about it, but he gave me no chance to explain why I issued the policy. Why did you? Oh, now, really? Well? Well, I made it very clear to George that I would tell him when he calms down enough to be reasonable. Really, Mr. Dollar, he was in quite a tizzy. Brother, he still is. That's why he sent for me. But when he calms down, he'll be sorry he bothered you. Suppose you tell me why you issued that policy. You? No. What? No, I'll tell George when he's ready and when I'm ready. Oh, now, just a minute. And you may tell George I said exactly that. Goodbye, Dollar. You'll tell me, Baxter, right now. I'll do nothing of the sort. And what's more, since my plane for Europe is leaving shortly, I have no time to do, to, to... Would you kindly remove your foot from the door? Not until I get an answer from you. Now start talking. If you can show some legal cause... Legal why, cause? Uh, furthermore, your behavior at the moment constitutes trespass, illegal entry, uh, call it what you like. And believe me, unless you leave here immediately, I shan't hesitate to ring up the police. All right, all right. Now look, just tell me one thing. I might. What? 
What is your connection with the beneficiary of this policy? Dr. Schwinner. That's right, Albert Schwinner. But Albert happens to be a very close personal friend. Oh, I might have guessed as much. All right, then tell me this. Uh, I'm sorry, just one question. I've given the answer. Goodbye. Right, sir. Are you hard of hearing? Look right here now. Goodbye. <laughs> Well, there was no point in trying to batter down the door of Harry Baxter's apartment, so I left. Downstairs in the lobby, I put in a phone call. That's item 355 cents to George Reed's office in Hartford. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but he seems to have stepped out for a few minutes. Oh, well, uh, then please tell him when he gets back that I want a complete rundown on Harry Baxter. Well, that shouldn't be difficult. Right. Having hired him, George shouldn't have much trouble getting that for me. Well, that isn't what I meant, Mr. Dollar. As a matter of fact, I think I can tell you just Now, let much. George do it. I'll call him back. Item 465 cents taxi to Mary Ellen Markham's apartment on East 52nd Street. A uniformed nurse met me at the door, told me I could stay with Miss Markham only a very short time, then led me into the bedroom. And there, carefully propped up in bed, lay a pale, wan, tired woman who looked to be 65 or 70. The room was full of flowers. You may leave us, Mrs. Haskell. I'll ring when I need you. Yes, Miss Markham. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I'm sorry. I won't be able to speak with you very long. But as you can see... Yes, yes, I can, of course. I'll get right to the point. You must know, I'm sure, that someone has just taken out a policy on your... Well, an insurance policy on you. Yes. And you're so smart. And so... And so helpful with Harry Baxter. Oh. You see, I am suffering from a rare, incurable disease of the blood. I'm sorry. I don't have long to live. A few days, perhaps. A few weeks at the most. Excuse me. This is such an effort. Well, you, you're getting the best of care, I trust. Yes. The very best. Now, now, what do you wish to know? You know a Dr. Albert Schwinner, don't you? I have known Albert for many years. He's been great friends. Then why does he take out a policy that, well, that indicates he hopes that you'll die? Hopes? I'll die? Yes. What else could it be? Oh, you don't understand. Don't you see? Schwinner has bought insurance against your living beyond November 10th. Yes. Yes. My 50th birthday. You mean to say you're... The reason... The reason so. Yes? I'm sorry. You you mustn't. Oh, I know. I'm tired. Yes, Yes. But just one more thing. Your doctor... The doctor who's taking care of you. Albert. Albert? This same Dr. Schwinner? Yes. Now. Now you must leave. of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. The little that Mary Ellen Markham had been able to tell me left me more puzzled than ever. I've never been given such a runaround in my life, deliberate or otherwise. But I didn't dare tax her strength further, so I left. Item five, another 55 cents for another call to George Reed in Hartford. This time he was in. Yes, Johnny, I must confess I'm calmed down a bit, but the first shock of learning that Mr. Baxter had issued that seemingly absurd policy... What do you mean, seemingly absurd? George's whole thing has been a tizzy now, a double-barreled one. Well, I tried to call Mr. Baxter a few minutes ago, but got no answer. I wanted to apologize, of course. Apologize? For well, after all, since he's chairman of the board... Chairman of what board? The company, this company... What? I tried to tell you that this morning, but you didn't give me a chance. Harry Baxter is also the majority stockholder. Oh, brother. In any event, as I'm sure you can see, he must have had some good reason for that policy. And as soon as I can get him by phone... You won't. What? He just left for Europe. 
Where? I don't know, and right now I don't care. But if I can't contact him, Johnny, I don't dare cancel this policy until I've talked to him. And if Miss Markham should die before the 10th... Yeah, 250 G. You've got to carry on. Would you like to tell me how... If Mary Ellen Markham dies on or before November 10th, Floyd's of England pays Dr. Albert Schwinner $250,000 on a policy taken out by him. And he is her doctor with her life in his hands. And if there isn't something wrong with that setup, Expense account item six, eight dollars for a taxi to Schwinner's address in Union City, New Jersey. And there at last I learned what the CL meant behind his name. It was an abbreviation, for this was the Albert Schwinner Clinic, devoted to the study of rare diseases of the blood. But Schwinner wasn't there. He'd gone to New York to see Miss Markham. Item seven, ten dollars even for a fast taxi ride back there to Manhattan. As the nurse led me into the unfortunate woman's apartment, he was just coming out of the bedroom door. Oh, Dr. Schwinner, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar, Harry Baxter told me I might expect you. Oh, he did, huh? Yes, he phoned me just before his plane took off for Europe. Pretty smart. You're an insurance investigator, aren't you? That is right. Oh, you may go in to see Miss Markham now, Mrs. Haskell. Very well, Doctor. How is Miss Markham, Doctor? Much better, thank God. Oh, why do you say that? What? If she dies before this week is out, you stand to collect a cool quarter of a million, don't you? I? No, the clinic. Isn't that the same thing? Hardly. But sit down, Mr. Dollar. Now, you're concerned about the rather unorthodox insurance policy that Mr. Baxter issued. I certainly am. I think you'd better let me tell you the reason for it. I think you'd better. At the onset of her illness some 15 years ago, the best doctors in the country gave her five years to live at the most. And that's when you came into the picture? Yes. Because of the devotion, the concentration of all our efforts to this one field of medicine, the clinic was able for the first time to give her hope. Her hope was justified. We have given her years of life. But now, wait a minute, Doctor. She told us then that if she could be helped to live until she was 50... And that'll be on the 10th. Yes. That would prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that our methods, our practices were right. That we could prolong and possibly ultimately save not only her own, but thousands, perhaps millions of lives. Therefore, she agreed that if she reached 50, she would make an outright gift of $250,000 to the clinic and its work. Money which is much needed, by the way. But then it began to look as though she might never reach 50. Yes. And she suggested this unusual insurance policy on her death rather than on her life. I see. But why Harry Baxter, chairman of the board of the insurance company, its biggest stockholder, whatever? I don't get it. Baxter's own mother died of the same disease, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Of course. Then... He knew how necessary this money is to the clinic. Yes. And let's face it, Baxter is something of uh, an eccentric. And that's the reason he chose this... this offbeat way to make sure you'd get the financial help you need. Exactly. Then, if I try to get this policy canceled... A great many lives in the future may depend on its remaining in force. Of course, if you feel it your duty. Doctor, my duty as I see it is to do just exactly nothing. Mary Ellen Markham did live to see 50, but only for a few days. Just long enough to make her gift to the clinic. Harry Baxter and the company? Well... Harry came back from Europe, and he said he found some, quote, mistake, unquote, in the policy that requires the company to pay off on it anyway. <laughs> Eccentric? We should have more of them like that. Expense account total? Are you kidding? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Welcome back. This is officially the most confusing uh, episode of Johnny Dollar I've heard. Now, this was written by Jack Johnstone, who had a big job, even with the reduced length of the show, as he was directing and producing and writing nearly every week. And this script is the result. Of course, what we get in the second half of the program, it's confusing because the terms of the insurance contract seem to change. What originally alarms George and the hook is that a death insurance policy has been written, providing an insurance payment of $250,000 if Miss Markham doesn't live past November 10th. However, when we get into the later acts of the show, it turns out that this is actually an insurance policy that will pay off if Mrs. Markham dies before November 10th. And therefore, it's not a death insurance policy at all, but a short-term life insurance policy. And then at the end of the show, it turns out there's an insurance policy. It'll pay off whether she dies or doesn't. It's almost as if Jack Johnstone were revising the story. Because it's originally set out. The only thing to really be concerned about is the uh, insurance company hiring a hitman to make sure that uh, Mrs. Markham died before November 10th. And then we come to the question of why Harry Baxter decided to issue this death insurance policy. Not only is it strange and eccentric, it really is something dubious to decide to I invent a new brand, uh, new type of uh, insurance policy like that. Why would he do that? And it seems like Jack Johnstone decided to add some realism by having it turn out that he felt free to write the insurance policy because he was the majority shareholder and CEO of the company. Or not CEO, but uh, chairman of the board. And of course, the chairman of the board will often sit in for a vacationing uh, insurance agent. And the big problem is that it was clear from the first scene that George Reed wasn't aware of this. How can you not be aware that your friend is chairman and C, uh, chairman of of the board and chief stockholder of the company you work at. And again, I don't say this to rag too much on Johnstone. I think the script is probably an evidence of just how much work he had to do. Because this was the first of three straight scripts that he would write. And essentially, he's writing close to two-thirds of the scripts for the show, as well as all of his other duties. And so that, along with the lesser length, is going to uh, affect the quality of the program overall and lead to some efforts that are kind of hard to follow. All right, well, on to some listener comments and feedback. Uh, John uh, emails in, and he says, Of the shows you're running now, I enjoy Johnny Dollar the best, but I always save uh, the episode for my Monday morning commute to start my week out right. Um, when you were doing the serialized broadcast, I'd save them up and listen to them in order, one right after the other. It really made it easier to follow the story. Well, uh, thanks so much, and uh, we'll look at doing some more of those special um, omnibus. Uh, we've done four of the omnibus, uh, all five episodes together so far, and we've gotten pretty good reaction. And then we have an email from Lisa says, Thank you for all you do to put the great detectives of old time radio on the air. I love telling my friends about your program, and I recognize how much you've grown in the way you present the material as a polished uh, speaker. Uh, I sat on, a, and she says, I sat on a plane next to someone from Boise, and she didn't sound anything like you, but that's okay. Are you sure you're not from Georgia? As a native New Yorker who now lives in the Midwest, I'm not one to criticize, just tease a little. Well, thanks so much. Uh, and as you reference, uh, the accents with which we speak, particularly in our world where people move around so much, uh, aren't just tied to the place we are from, but all the places we've been, the people we've encountered and grown up around. Uh, my dad was down south for many years, and if you uh, hear just a tiny hint of that accent, um, I caught that from him. And I did spend a few months down there. Actually, I didn't move to Boise until I was 22, almost 23. So... 
Also, a t- extra accent materials may have been picked up in Kalispell, where I lived for many years, and then traveling all over the country, though a lot around Washington State. Yeah, it's hard to trace the origins of whatever I've got in my voice. But thanks so much for your comments, Lisa. And that will do it for today. We'll be back next week with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. And join us tomorrow for Dragnet. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook.